there are so many reasons to criticize not only this interview with Billy Porter about his decision to play James Baldwin, but also all of his stances beyond that. I'm going to try and bring some nuance to this TikTok. I'm going to try and bring some fucking nuance to this. I'm going to spend some time breaking down why. And the reason that you should be listening to me is because I'm 29 years old. I published my first book two years ago. Since I've learned about James Baldwin, for me as a queer black person, I have very much tried to study him, tried to travel in his footsteps. In 2016, I went to France for the first time. I fell in love with my first boyfriend. I attended riots there. I've been a grassroots organizer for the last 10 years. I've read Baldwin extensively. I read Giovanni's Room every year. Two years ago, I did an artist residency in saint paul de vence France, where James Baldwin lived for over seven years and passed away. If there's anyone that fucking cares about James Baldwin and wants to highlight him and also be critical about his legacy, it's going to be me. Billy Porter choosing to play James Baldwin and in this interview saying, I don't know about all that shit over there, Israel. I don't know. I don't know. I want a two-state solution. It's basically... Like someone in the future deciding to play Beyonce in a biopic and saying all you need to do to prepare is to have a good wig or maybe even a half decent wig. Are you fucking kidding me? James Baldwin. James Baldwin, who is a staunch opponent to the state of Israel and their degradation and genocide against Palestinians. And today, Billy Porter wants to act like he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. If you want to be a queer person living in James Baldwin's legacy, benefiting off of his name, choosing to co-write a script, lead act in it, and you can't even fucking read history, who the fuck are you here for? Because if you don't know any of this history, you can easily play this role, and this trash that will inevitably come out is going to be an even further mutilation of James Baldwin's memory. And it, it just fucking pisses me off because... To be in the art elite and still like navigate all the complexities of being queer and black and like struggling to be an artist and you're freelance, etc. To not even acknowledge the amount of power and privilege that your fucking platform has to help people that have less than you, whether here in other parts of the world, and to do it in the name of James Baldwin. You're a fucking idiot. Let's break down some of the worst quotes from this article so I can really dig into this even more because I'm fucking pissed the more that I think about it. I mean, the first one, we are, we start out the gate. Over the course of our 45-minute interview, he, Porter, compares himself with the four-time Oscar-nominated Viola Davis on three separate occasions. Another great quote from Billy Porter in this article, she played every crack mother, every mother of a drug addict, every stereotypical dark-skinned black woman role they threw at her, and she imbued those characters with dignity. I was like, that's what I'm going to do, he says, of Viola Davis. Porter decided that he did not care about being pigeonholed in the business and that he would take the queer roles and imbue them with so much dignity that by the time the industry was ready to give serious, nuanced roles to a black gay man, he would be the bitch you call. Streaming destroyed the artist's ability to make money, our ability to participate in capitalism. Being an artist, we're always freelance and we're very often blue collar. I, one of the big problems that I have with how biopics are happening now is that it's less about a critical engagement with what the artist's memory was and what their intentions and functions of their art were, and it's more emotional marketing. If we're making a James Baldwin biopic that is here to serve the actor who is co-writing it and lead acting in it, what does this biopic do to serve the legacy of James Baldwin? James Baldwin was against capitalism. He was against the evils of the American project. He was also against American exceptionalism, the ability of Americans, whether black or not, to go abroad and to escape the evils of what the U.S. produces. He as an artist said that our responsibility as an artist is to bear witness to the atrocities that are happening in this world and to articulate them in a way that the masses can understand. What does it mean for Billy Porter to make a James Baldwin biopic and not give a fuck that children, women, men in Palestine are being carpet bombed? They're going through numerous processes of colonization, of genocide. They're having war crimes committed against them. When black communities in the U.S. have experienced the same thing, while people say, I don't give a fuck about that. What if people didn't give a fuck about you, Billy Porter? What if no one wanted to hire you ever again? It'd probably be actually a good thing because you don't know how to read a fucking history book. Another choice quote. Now he's putting his writing skills to work, co-writing a biopic based on the life of revolutionary writer and activist James Baldwin, in which he will also star. His motivation, Porter says, if not me, who? I've been sitting around waiting for people to tell the Links and Hughes story, the James Baldwin story, anyone black and queer. As far as I'm concerned, I'm done waiting. I'll do it. 
myself. The audacity, right? Who's going to tell it better than the black gay man who embodies that in today's age? It's just an important story to tell. And I feel so blessed to be in this time where it will get told. The person that embodies James Baldwin in today's day and age, you mean fucked up Cinderella performance? You mean, it's just, I don't understand how narcissism goes so far that someone wants to actively participate in capitalism, bolster that, fight for that, and then will turn around and say, yeah, I can also play James Baldwin. I mean, I don't really give a fuck about any of the nuanced, the nuanced takes on artistry or being a subject of colonization. It's, it's, and I don't, and this is the problem I have with Baldwin nostalgia, nostalgia for these past figures that represent a sort of nonviolent or a more uh, nuanced approach to the political happenings of history. If people want to celebrate Mal Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, James Baldwin, you have to celebrate them within the things that they challenged in their historical context. James Baldwin was the subject of all sorts of homophobia. James Baldwin was beaten up physically numerous times for his sexuality or for his race. James Baldwin traveled to other countries and studied other people's histories and struggles and incorporated that into his artwork. To be a modern artist and claiming that you're living in the legacy of James Baldwin while also actively erasing and ignoring and a genocide that's happening and supporting the genocidal state that is doing it, it means you're fucking evil. And you're not, not all skin folk or kin folk. You're definitely not my kin folk. And it, it just raises the question of if we're making art about revolutionary individuals of the past, should that art not be revolutionary today? Should it not force people to confront the evils and atrocities that are happening in today? And if not, that art is in service of erasure. And if you're a gay black man working in service of the erasure of a figure like James Baldwin, you don't fucking deserve to be an artist. And this series is going to be called Putting an End to James Baldwin Nostalgia. Really what my critique is of Billy Porter playing James Baldwin and doing his recent Guardian interview where he literally says, we're only talking about the civil rights. We don't care about the Middle East. And I'm not about that stuff. That's what happened 40, 50, 60 years ago. It's 2024. When people say that shit, they're not only a coon, but they become a tool of white supremacy. Because mind you, I'm 29. I published my first book two years ago about being a queer black anarchist. I've traveled to France. I have lived there. I fell in love there. I've gone to protest there. I've been an, arg I've been an organizer in both the U.S. and abroad. And this isn't to say that my perspective is the only right perspective, but I enjoy being critical about the ways that we attach ourselves to history and how the ways that we attach ourselves to history can be for the benefit of our liberation and how it can be for the benefit of capitalism or commodification. And so I want to talk about this phrase called James Baldwin nostalgia that I've curated over time. And to enter this discussion, I want to mention that two years ago, I did an artist residency in St. Paul de Vence. And for those that don't know, James Baldwin lived in St. Paul de Vence, I think, for over seven years. He passed away there. It was this small town in south of France near Nice. And I remember walking around this town a lot for a little over a month and thinking, why did he end up here? What about his life and his experiences caused him to want to travel, to bear witness close to the events happening here in the U.S. and abroad? And I think that drive for James Baldwin to leave was based in this sort of dissonance with a world that didn't care about history, a world that didn't care about structural racism, a world that didn't care about the emotional consequences of hatred and colonization. And so to see a modern contemporary artist try to conflate James Baldwin image with, like, I don't know, goals like sanitizing him and making him only the civil rights figure or not reading into the deep internationalism that he had. It's, it's, it's profiting off of his memory while you're lying about him. And I think it's disgusting. Do most people think they know about James Baldwin? I think there are a few categories, and I'm going to put this up on screen. I had so much fun writing these. Oh, wasn't he gay or something? He was a little gay. People know. Oh, he wrote shit. Like, didn't he write a book? Like, he wrote, um, he wrote I'm Not Your Negro. Oh, didn't he know I'm okay? Yes, he did. He was at the March on Washington. I think uh, James Baldwin was sad and angry or something. Yes, he was sad a lot of the times and he was angry. And the reason I mentioned these sort of mass cursory perspectives on someone like Baldwin is that it's important to know that 
this reductionism of him is because of historical erasure. It's because of the homophobia he faced during his life. It's because his literature was considered taboo. It's because his literature confronted state powers at the time to the point that the FBI and the state were observing him, following him, documenting his movements. Like, that's some real counterinsurgency type shit. And so he was a part, a very real part of, of cultural awakenings that were happening in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But the reason that more people don't know more is because there is this nostalgia that we attach to James Baldwin or he's erased in a way that doesn't allow us to know really anything at all. And so what is James Baldwin nostalgia, you might ask? I define it as the mixture of the co-optation of identity politics mixed with the sanitization of history. This can be selective memory. This can be um, sanitizing or reducing someone's politics. And these two things are towards the purpose of profit and convenience. And I say profit meaning when people make biopics, they can profit on a social level, gain more clout, get awards. They can also profit financially. You've made one of the first biopics about James Baldwin. It'll be remembered in history, blah, blah, blah. And then convenience. If we sanitize the image of someone like James Baldwin, it makes him more easily foldable into the American project, capitalism, imperialism, and just this sort of current period of, of rising fascism and historical erasure. Why is the alt-right trying to ignore black histories, trans histories, indigenous histories? It's because those histories don't serve the kind of world that they want. It doesn't serve them being in the majority. And so if we sanitize a figure like James Baldwin, it's just a part of a larger slippery slope. And this is why it's important for us to critique. I want to end this video with some questions to help orient us. If we wish to remember others, why not remember them honestly, fully? Otherwise, is our memory not self-serving? And I ask this very seriously as someone that has written extensively about my life, written a memoir, I've studied other black political figures, and even in writing about my life, I knew that my memory couldn't tell the whole story, but it was important to interrogate why I remembered things the way that I did and what that says about the structures around us. And I think when we choose to remember people in these diluted forms, we don't do our research, we don't read into history and we misrepresent them, not only doing a disservice to history, not, we're not only doing a disservice to the present, but we're doing a disservice to future people that deserve a clear and complex nuanced understanding of someone like James Baldwin. The fact that I didn't know about him until college is fucked up. And I'm a gay black kid growing up in America. If you remember someone in ways that serve your own narcissism or your own placement in the world, and you don't allow their life and their story and their experiences to challenge you, it's an erasure. It's, 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 it's a lack of engagement with reality and it's engagement with an illusion. Another question that we can ask ourselves is, how does cultural erasure benefit the elite and hurt the masses? It benefits the elite by giving the masses a more diluted and less radical version of history. If James Baldwin wasn't really as radical as he was, then we don't need to be as radical as he was in his context now in order to oppose the forces that are still at play, like racism, homophobia, misogyny, genocide, colonialism. And it hurts the masses because we don't have a true connection to our history. How many gay black kids out there could see a beautiful biopic about James Baldwin that charts his younger years, that goes into his travels abroad, that goes into his struggles with mental health, that goes into the various contentions he felt around his writing and his career and his representations of blackness. What would that offer us? Would it offer us a depiction of a man that was struggling to be a part of his people and also trying to navigate the violence of his people experience as well? What would this offer to younger audiences? I think it would offer a lot, and it's what we need right now in a world that has increasing forms of fascism, where we're going through a recession, ecological crisis, another president, <laughs> Trump might be president again, and we want to lie on figures like James Baldwin when it really matters and we can learn even more from him. It just doesn't make sense. I'm going to have a lot more to say, but this is the first installment of this. Like and comment with your thoughts, and please, please let me know, do you think Billy Porter should be playing James Baldwin? Who might be a better option? And what kind of biopic do you want to see? Two years ago, I did an artist residency in saint paul de vence France. And because it was where James Baldwin had lived for over seven years and passed away, I actually got to meet a, like maybe four or five people that actually knew him. I got to meet a woman that grew up in a restaurant that he ate at. I got to meet just like other random people that knew him in different capacities because he 
hung out at the bars and the cafes in the town. And the biggest thing that I remember people telling me about him that knew him, which was really, really interesting to me, is they said he loved Black Label whiskey. He loved to drink. He loved to drink it down. You'd always find him at the Commodore. You'd always find him at that other big cafe in the plaza. And think because of my experiences as a queer black traveler and experiencing anti-blackness and weirdness and microaggressions in other places, it seemed a bit strange to me at some points during my time there that Baldwin would live in this small town in southern France near Nice for so long because it felt, in some ways, it felt like a sort of, um, like an exile. And I don't mean that as in like, Baldwin was banished there and no one wanted him anymore. It, it It's not that precisely. It's just more that I maybe imagined a later version of his life where he'd be surrounded by Black people and surrounded by community. And I do understand that his time abroad and life abroad meant a lot to him. But it, it just felt a little strange in that way. And then to hear people say, oh, he drank a lot. Like, you know, he liked to drink it down. And and it was so casual, but it gave me a lot of pause because even in my time in Saint Paul de Bons, there was a little bit of loneliness. And if I'm looking back over Baldwin's life, he had a dear friend, Eugene Worth, that passed away. He was tired of systemic racism in the U.S. He went to France, um, got big as a writer, also confronted more of the evils of the civil rights movement from close and afar, came back to do journalism in the South, contended with a lot of homophobia, a lot of racism within the civil rights movement from the white liberal imagination. He makes a break with what kind of white society needs of him and turns more into like more jazz style renditions of lyricism, um, is trying to more deeply connect with his blackness. But all the while, there's this romantic suffering. There's this loss. There are these numerous um, bouts of suicidal ideation. I mean, he got arrested for a stolen bed sheet in Paris. Um, and if you read his bio biographies about him, you do get this ongoing sense of longing. And what I really think about it is that when you reach such a level of fame and hypervisibility that you matter so much to people, you matter based on the function they have in your life and not because you're your inner fuller humanity. I mean, Baldwin struggled with like injuries and health stuff. He passed away from cancer. He dealt with like, I mean, he, he like to me, like with the way people were talking about his drinking, I was like, did he drink that much? Like, was it that? And this isn't to denigrate substance use because I'm very harm reduction. I do believe that people use drugs in so many different ways. And some people just use drugs to get by, to survive, to work through shit. And that's real at the center of an essay that I wrote a few years ago that I mentioned in another video in an America on Fire, James Baldwin's legacy led me to Paris. A central question I had in that essay was if society had treated Baldwin better, how much happier would have his life had been? How much more joy or less loneliness would his later years have had? And this question matters so much to me because I think it's at the heart of some of the underlying suffering that queer people experience. I mean, if you are cast out of your home in certain ways, you are cast out of your country and you're searching for all these things in the world, um, where does queer displacement lead you? And this was kind of a central question in my book, which is why I really admire and love Baldwin, because I do think there are a lot of meaningful things to extrapolate from the Black experience abroad, from how Black people cope with systemic suffering and Baldwin was such a light to other people, but I also wish deeply that he had lived in a society that had the capacity to take care of him better while he was trying to take care of the world and people around him. Um, and, and this is such a complicated issue because Baldwin also had flaws. There are flaws in his writing. I mean, a complicated flawed human being and even in the ways he treated people around him, which you'll learn more about if you read more of his biography. But I think, and if you look at so many black great figures, they ended in ways that a lot of us wish things had ended better for them. And I think it's important to look at blackness, the psychological impacts of systemic racism and suffering, how isolation and loneliness is often a part of black iconography. And it's not something that we talk about. In some ways, wish the same for Baldwin, even though I know 
from reading David Lemming's biography that he was surrounded by love and people that knew him near the end. Um, but you always want more for the people you love. The reason that I think it's so important to talk about James Bond and nostalgia is because nostalgia dehumanizes both the subject of that nostalgia and it also dehumanizes the people that could benefit from a more honest and authentic version of that legacy. This episode is all about James Baldwin's mental health and a lot of the things that I've learned over the years that people don't really talk about a lot. And this starts with James Baldwin in a diner in Greenwich Village a few years before he goes to Paris. Um, he is sitting with his best friend Eugene Worth and they're having a disagreement. Um, Worth is saying to Baldwin, you're a poet, you don't believe in love, you don't believe in these ways of organizing, we've been friends, out together, being together all the time. This conversation in this diner is the opening scene of an essay that I wrote a few years ago called In an America on Fire, James Baldwin's Legacy Led Me to Paris. And Eugene Worth eventually died by suicide, and this left a shadow over James Baldwin alongside all of the racism that he was facing in New York City at the time. At the age of 24, he went to Paris. Eugene Worth's death really traumatized James Baldwin, and I think in a lot of ways you can read traces of it throughout his literature. There's literally the character of Rufus, who dies in the same exact way that James Baldwin's friend. First points throughout his life and his career and fame, James Baldwin had all sorts of health issues. He also sh struggled with mental health and suicidal ideation. I think there is so much about James Baldwin that we revere and love. There's so many essays that speak really critically to America and patriotism and identity and, and race. But so many people don't actually know the specifics of how he suffered, how he was followed by the FBI, how he at many times throughout his life felt at odds with what many people considered the majority black community. He experienced all sorts of homophobia. I mean, other people in the civil rights movement would call him Martin Luther Queenie. Um, he was disinvited from the March on Washington. All of this just speaks to me about the isolation of reaching a certain level of, of black visibility and how for Baldwin that was compounded by the racism of his time. That was compounded by all of the struggles that other colonial and post-colonial nations were going through. It was compounded by um, his his poverty. I mean, he gave so much much of his money to his family, and to spend the last of his days in Saint Paul de Vence, rightfully writing, being a person, being a full human being, but also struggling to, in a lot of ways, connect with the larger culture to still feel as relevant as he said. They're killing my friends. And by the end of his life, so many people had been lost. And what did James Baldwin had left? In the end, his brother wasn't even able to save his home. And that was one of his dying wishes. We revere so many of these figures throughout history, but we don't know the specifics of the sacrifices that they went through to not only exist and live and to produce the art and the cultural moments that they did that we love so much, but also to just survive their particular context. When we humanize them, we can look at our worlds more clearly and understand why we struggle through the things that we do now. And I really hope that this is a reminder for people to read into the figures that you admire, understand them on a human level, and don't allow people to make fucking shitty biopics about them. That's all. If you've been liking my TikToks on James Baldwin, I would also recommend that you check out my first book. It's titled When They Tell You To Be Good. I knew that it was important for me to write throughout it about my relationship with James Baldwin, about learning about him in college, being dissatisfied with the job I had in Seattle, and traveling to France for the first time, with falling in love, with going back to France to turn 24 because Baldwin turned 24 there, with reading his work while I was scrubbing hotel room floors, and really studying him when I was getting into the process of writing this book. And one thing that I really wanted to showcase was the emotional realities of being an organizer, radical person, queer person, and artist. But so much of creative nonfiction is about lionizing ourselves, or especially for Black men, it's about being powerful and strong. But similar to Baldwin and his writing style, I wanted to have a deep sense of lyricism and also expose the pitfalls of organizing, of struggling with mental health, of dealing with anti-blackness abroad. And I really view this book as being in lineage with James Baldwin because it's a travelogue and it addresses all sorts of things that have affected my family's history from Jamaica to the US. So if you're looking for a new read, check out my book. I've been spreading the news about Billy Porter's Zionism and why that makes him unsuitable to co-produce 
co-lead and co-write the forthcoming biopic about James Baldwin. And I want to share two important updates on my end in terms of the research I've been doing. There is a petition out right now to call for an end to this Billy Porter project. In the last week or so, signatures have gone up. They've gone up around 150 signatures. The goal is 500 and it's about a halfway point. Um, I'm hoping that this petition can get to 500 by the end of this week, which I think is more than possible. Another update is that the creative queen of Ratchet has been working on an independent James Baldwin biopic for the last few years. And if you go to any of this creator's social media, you can see a donate to James Baldwin biopic link. And this biopic is independently written. It's by someone that respects James Baldwin. I interviewed Queen of Ratchet a few years ago about this project, and they definitely understand why James Baldwin is necessary in today's time. This petition's goal is to get to $500,000, and so far it is rate 857. So please check out the link in my bio or check out either of these petitions on your own to help people that are either trying to stop this Billy Porter project or support an independently made James Baldwin biopic called Becoming James Baldwin. One of the biggest reasons I try to write about Baldwin and research him so much is because when you dig even just a little bit past the surface, you learn so much about how much he suffered, how much he fought, how much he tried to be the person that people needed him to be while he was dealing with heartbreak, while he was dealing with racism, with homophobia, with suicidal ideation, with all kinds of health issues. And I really believe that when we learn more about historical figures that we claim to care about, we humanize them. Like, shit was fucking hard for him. And I feel so grateful to understand him in a fuller way, even just by researching and caring. So it's important. It's just important. It's it's black queer life. Um, and we have to reclaim it, like our histories. Did you know that James Baldwin would most likely be against this forthcoming biopic based on his life that is currently being written by Billy Porter? Here's why. Here's another installment of putting an end to James Baldwin nostalgia. I read about Baldwin all the time, and still when I revisit his work, I rediscover things anew. And a day or two ago, I was reading his collection of essays, No Name in the Street. In the first essay, which I'm mentioning that because if Billy Porter really cared about James Baldwin, you could have read this and like heeded some of James Baldwin's advice. When Martin was murdered, I was based in Hollywood, working, working in fact, on the screen version of the autobiography of Malcolm X. This was a difficult assignment since I had known Malcolm, after all, crossed swords with him, worked with him, and held him in that great esteem which is not easily distinguishable, if it is distinguishable at all, from love. The Hollywood gig did not work out because I did not wish to be a party to a second assassination, but we will also return to Hollywood presently. This is why James Baldwin eats. He says, I did not wish to be party to a second assassination. And this is what I'm talking about. The people that are saying, why does it matter that Billy Porter signed this letter in support of Israel? Why does it matter that Palestinians are being genocided? If you're going to make a movie about James Baldwin, you better fucking know what he wrote about. James Baldwin was against the Hollywood machine. He wanted his art to represent something in the years beyond himself. He wanted to be moral. He wanted to have ethics. He wanted to be a humanist. He wanted to respect the sanctity of humanity and understand the complexities of how genocide and oppression can happen to people in all different parts of the world. And so to make a movie about him today currently in Hollywood, like Billy Porter is, and to say that we need to follow where the money is, we need to tell the kind of story that the executives want, that is not the right way to tell history if you're actually trying to tell history honestly. It's maddening to me to know that the answers to what this biopic needs to be is literally in James Baldwin's writing, and the people like Billy Porter and Allen Media Group and everyone who's behind this biopic that is skirting over the ways that James Baldwin was taboo and challenged the status quo in his lifetime. Shame on these people. And I want people to continue to pay attention to this. There's a petition that's out there that's calling for Billy Porter to be removed from the project. Sign that if you feel the need. I also have a long form video on my channel where I talk all about this even more extensively. And that link is in my bio. I'm launching a new newsletter called Notes on Baldwin, where I write different long and short form pieces about Baldwin and I'm definitely going to be taking some of these nostalgia takes from here on TikTok onto Substack, so check that out as well. In 1979, James Baldwin wrote a letter to the nation called Open Letter to the Born Again. In this piece, James Baldwin talks about his perspective on Israel, Palestine, and the Zionist logic, the Zionist question. 
In this piece, James Baldwin states, Jews and Palestinians know of broken promises. From the time of the Balfour Declaration, during World War I, Palestine was under five British mandates, and England promised the land back and forth to the Arabs or the Jews, depending on which horse seemed to be in the lead. The Zionists, as distinguished from people known as Jews, using, as someone put it, the available political machinery, i.e. colonialism, the British Empire, promised the British that if the territory were given to them, the British Empire would be safe forever. And then Baldwin goes on to state, but absolutely no one cared about the Jews, and it is worth observing that non-Jewish Zionists are frequently anti-Semitic. While white Americans responsible for sending black slaves to Liberia did not do this to set them free, they despised them and they wanted to get rid of them. Lincoln's intention was not to free the slaves, but to destabilize the Confederate government by giving their slaves reason to defect. Most importantly in this piece, Baldwin says, but the state of Israel was not created for the salvation of Jews. It was created for the salvation of the Western interests. This is what is becoming clear. I must say that it was always clear to me. The Palestinians have been paying for the British colonial policy of divide and rule and this guilty Christian conscience for more than 30 years. And how so many non-Jewish Zionists are actually anti-Semitic and don't didn't want Jews in Britain, in Europe. And that's why they established Israel with the Balfour Declaration as a place for Jewish people to live safely. What is interesting and necessary here is that Baldwin is talking about how identity, um, how proximity to violence, how proximity to colonialism, and the state powers that support are all signifiers of whether or not it is a settler colonial force. And it's really, really important that we have these distinctions on what anti-Semitism is, on what Zionism is, and what power dynamics are at play in terms of how the state of Israel was even established in the first place. I know I commented at this person a few times in my video, but I also want to speak to when people leave comments like this online, because it really doesn't rub me the right way. I think the first is online, there's a very clear distinction between trusting people's intent and also realizing that people are bots and will rage for them and comment any fucking thing to get attention online. Two, when we're talking about genocide, history, representations in media, topics of liberation, I'm not going to slow down to explain things at length to someone that jumps into a conversation in a condescending way or is asking questions that are meant to be an edgelord or wants to be conspiratorial or is talking about semantics. If I'm literally talking about a black revolutionary figure that is being represented today and their political ideas are being misrepresented and someone wants to come into the comments and ask me, why should this biopic care about Palestine? It means that this person doesn't care about history and they're asking this question in order to sow some kind of dissent that isn't even based in the argument that I'm trying to make. I'm talking about historical representation. I'm talking about whether or not we care about genocide today and what that says about us culturally in similar ways to how James Baldwin talked about systemic racism, internationalism, allyship in his lifetime. And so to not draw those connections and to waste time, like when we are, when we're fighting oppression, when we're fighting all these systemic wrongs, like there's a very clear distinction between having a productive conversation and slowing down for people that want to make you feel like an idiot for caring. And if you're doing the latter, if anyone is doing the latter to me, I'm not going to be nice back because why be nice to people that are feigning ignorance? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Yes, Baldwin did leave the U.S. at the age of 24. He had $40 to his name. And he went to Paris because he was curious about leaving the U.S. And he talked a lot about how he didn't know what would happen if he left the U.S., but he would know what would happen to him if he ended up going to Europe or somewhere else. James Baldwin ended up living abroad for most of the rest of his life. He would return back to the U.S. to visit family or to do different writing gigs or teaching gigs, but most of his time was spent in other countries. He traveled to countries like Turkey, Switzerland, Istanbul. I think for a period of time, he might have even gone to Palestine. Um, and a big part of his kind of understanding of French culture was through, was through reading a lot of intellectuals, through understanding the Algerian struggle for autonomy and liberation, while Algerians were in France. There's so many great writings that he has about living abroad, 
but if you definitely check out his collections of essays, there's definitely one essay in particular that is about Americans' perspective in Paris and how a lot of Americans tend to travel and lean into the romanticism of being in other places, but don't necessarily deal with the realities of marginalized people in new places that they go to. So I highly recommend learning more about Baldwin's travels and time abroad because you'll learn a lot. And I think about this quote all the time as an artist because it's enraging to see people in Hollywood, the elite, make money off of histories that they wouldn't even be a part of today. Like, you know what I mean? Like James Baldwin fled the U.S., came back numerous times, wrote some real ass shit, contended with capitalism, and for Billy Porter or for anyone else to try to dilute that legacy, to misremember it, to reduce certain parts of it for convenience, it just means that we're we're still engaging in this kind of historical trap of nostalgia because we are only looking for the things that benefit us. And the the thing about this that feels like white supremacist or colonial is that this is what colonizers do. They look back at history and they pick and choose what sheds them, what paints them in a good light in order to justify the things that they did. And Billy Porter is doing the same exact thing. It's saying, I'm black, I'm queer, I lost my house, I can make a movie about James Baldwin. And it's like, that doesn't mean that you're going to do right by his legacy. And it doesn't mean that regular people aren't going to remember you as accurately as they can, which is you look like an award-hungry capitalist. So... This is why people read Angela Davis and so many other abolitionists, because abolitionary mindsets assert that modern day carcerality is essentially slavery reformed into another process and institution. And it's so clear. And now even outside of the carceral system, we can look all around the world and see slavery in so many countries, so many countries, especially due to globalization. So thank you for this point. It still exists today. It's still all around us. And we should be studying how and why. I think this is really easy to say if you haven't done any fucking research. If you've done fucking research, you would know that in the late 60s, Baldwin was hired to write a biopic about Malcolm X because of the studio's intervention and edits on the script. And because Martin Luther King died around the same time, James Baldwin almost went over the edge. He hated how Hollywood wanted to monopolize the image of his friends who fought for black liberation who fought against capitalism, who fought for humanism. He hated the fact that this production company in Hollywood wanted to dilute James Baldwin's image for profit during an era of time where counterinsurgency and state forces are trying to destabilize movements. What do you think is happening today with fascism on the rise, with book bans on the rise, with reproductive health being at risk, everywhere all around this country with there being numerous genocides happening and you want to say that depictions of radical historical figures don't fucking matter and we shouldn't read their work to understand what they actually thought about the systems that were up against them the same systems that are trying to make a biopic about james Baldwin today i don't understand how people can make claims online without evidence i have evidence do you read james baldwin <laughs> Ooh, the internet is weird. In the interview with The Guardian, Porter basically talks about how he took like screenplay classes and how this is kind of his way of getting back into screenwriting. I support any artist trying to make some art, but Zion, Z Zionism, 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 James Baldwin, those two phrases just don't mix together. So I hope someone else co-writes this project, especially since it's based on such an amazing book in the first place. Like if anyone of you haven't read David Lemming's autobiography or biography on James Baldwin, check it out. Residency I did two years ago in Sao Paulo de Vence, France. And I mentioned this residency because looking back at it now, I realize that it is my experience there, which had a lot of problems as a direct byproduct of how mishandling James Baldwin's legacy can lead to some fuckery for black queer artists today and this is a very clear example so i to an artist residency that was in honor of james baldwin it was about going to where he lived in france writing there making art and really just 
honoring and living in his legacy. And I applied, I got in, and then the pandemic happened and the residency was postponed, postponed. And then in the summer of 2022, I was able to decide to go. Uh, they didn't have a coordinated way for me to get groceries. It took them a long time for me to get my travel stipend. So you're, I'm paying my own way to get to France um, for doing laundry in the cottage that they provided me. They expected me to take the bus and it was 20, 30 minutes away. Um, and there wasn't a lot of really tangible direct support. And when I was doing this residency, it was also during the month of June, which was when this organization had a James Baldwin conference. And at this conference, some people were double charged. It was a really hot day in the summer and they had older black people walking around in the hot sun, no water. Um, I was asked as a resident of the residency to um, help host an open mic. I was given no materials. They had people coming to my place in the hot sun and I kept looking around at these black people and thinking, why are we here? And mind you, this is all on the back of over the years, as far as I understand, many different people have tried to save James Baldwin's house in Saint Paul de Vence, France, and it's failed for a variety of reasons. I won't get into that during this video, but essentially, the woman that started this residency was a white woman that just had a lot of issues with local people, rubbed them the wrong way, and essentially, the organization that hosted this residency that I was in was really struggling money-wise and they still wanted to host these things as a means to get the organization back on its feet and all of these flaws became apparent to me as I was experiencing the residency as I realized like oh these resources that you offer to people that are going to a different country in the name of this black queer artist legacy these resources aren't here to make even me feel really taken care of and then you invite academics in and they're walking around in the hot sun and yeah, for the conference, some people were double charged. Like people were asked for donations all the time after paying money to attend the conference. And um, I believe the director, who was this white woman, announced that she was leaving the organization at the last dinner for this conference. Um, some of the people that were helping organize the residency under the director, who had just resigned, invited me and another artist who was in the residency to dinner and they were like oh what do you think what do you think and i was like there's a lot of messed up stuff and it's messed up this is in the name of james baldwin's legacy and this organization wasn't forthright with where it's at debt wise and why these activities that people are attending are necessary for you to break even when you aren't forthcoming with people about this kind of information and they find out later, it feels like you're misleading them. And I think that's a core thing about doing things in the honor of someone's legacy. If people today who benefit from that legacy are in the lineage of that legacy, don't support what your project means and represents, why does it exist and who is it serving? Because I did a month long residency and Brenda, I got a lot of work done. I made friends. I knew how to handle things as things were going wrong. But in retrospect, I think don't black queer artists being invited somewhere in the name of James Baldwin deserve better? Shouldn't a biopic do better, be better, expose more? It's as tangible as that. I mean, people are leading initiatives today that need to be reformed and they're in James Baldwin's legacy. And I can't fully speak for the organization that hosted my residency. I know they've had a huge change of administration and I wish that organization the best, but we're looking at the symptom of historical erasure right now. Um, when I was in France, I probably met around three or four people that knew him personally. I met a woman that um, her father owned a restaurant in Saint Paul de Vence that James Baldwin went to a lot. I met um, that woman's sister. I also met someone that was his friend, like peripherally, that visited Saint Paul de Vence for this conference. Um, and I also like talked to this drunk guy who was James Baldwin's gardener for like a year <laughs> and he actually introduced me to the woman that knew him extensively through a restaurant um, and it was interesting I mean everyone I talked to basically said the same thing they said that he was kind of an anomaly in the space he 
was very social, that sometimes random, weird people would come up to him just to like kind of say edgelord things or kind of see what they could get a rise out of him. Um, and the resounding thing that people said is that he drank a lot. Like he loved Black Label whiskey. He was always at um, Cafe de la Place. He was always at um, La Colombe d'Or, I think is the name of the fancier restaurant. So it was interesting, if not a little bittersweet. The reason I am so adamant about reading James Baldwin, defending him, engaging with his memory in a critical way is that I understand how powerful his words and work and life has been for me. I learned about him when I was in college. And by college, I'd been writing for six years. I was writing white characters because I read all these canonical books that they assign you in school. And I think when I started reading him, I realized there is a way that I can begin to think and write and be critical about the conditions that I live through, the political, cultural, social life that I lived through, and how around the time that I discovered him and began reading him even more, it was right after college when I had been radicalized by Black Lives Matter, and I was thinking, how do I be a radical adult? And I went to Seattle, and I got this labor organizing job, and I just didn't feel right. And I kept reading about him and I read, he went to France. Maybe I could go to France. And I went to France and I met my first boyfriend. I went to May Day. I got to meet all sorts of <clears throat> people doing different political projects. And my world opened up and I continued to read James Baldwin. And I continued to understand his internationalism, um, how he delved into different kinds of art, how... He also has certain styles of writing I don't like. And he also talks about patriotism in a way I don't fucking like. And there are things about his life that I think are sad and weird. And also things that I th wish people knew more about. And to profit off of a deluded version of him, someone that is so dynamic and is needed in this culture, I think... It's sinister. I think it's evil. I think it's doing the work of white supremacy. And to also, for the people that are saying, oh, you care too much, or you can't expect actors to be like the people they're representing, I'm like, yes, the fuck I can. Yes, the fuck I can. That's the point of culture. That's the point of having standards. Like, do you know how black people and queer people throughout history are lied on for white supremacy, for fascism, and sort of let things slide? It's fucking ridiculous. So I just want to remind people, like, James Baldwin matters to a lot of people, and he matters to me, and that's why I'm on here engaging with this shit, because I think the conversation needs to happen. And if you don't want it to happen, question your standards. It's a biopic depicting his relationship with Eugene Worth, his best friend that passed away, I believe, um, a year or two before he went to Paris for the first time, and that friend kind of represented grief for Baldwin throughout his life, and I think also inspired the character Rufus in one of his novels. Um, and then actually, I just think a biopic about Baldwin's travels, like a series, would be really cool, because I'm interested in how his internationalism was affected by the different places he went to and how that could be visualized. Um, but another big idea that I've had is I've been planning to write a collection of essays about Baldwin for a long, 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 long time because there's so many things I want to write about and so many things that I've seen other people write about, but I want to see it written about at different angles and lenses, especially for me as a queer black person. But I know there's other people writing biopics too about him. This is a really good point and I want to expand on a little bit more because I do think there are a lot of reasons that biopics are being made. And I the first phrase that comes to mind once again is emotional marketing. Are these biopics actual engagements with these people's histories are they being critical are they shining a light on the more taboo aspects of their life or are they serving as emotional marketing are they trying to portray a particular strand of this figure's legacy is it trying to distill them down to something that is digestible because it's easier on a storytelling level um or is it an oscar or an awards grab is it to commemorate uh, a new anniversary in this person's history is it because of our fascination with loss and celebrity and death. Um, I think there are so many reasons to make a biopic. And we've seen a lot of these reasons over the past few years with Judas and the Black Messiah. The intent of that was to sort of portray the Black Panther Party's history from a certain lens. 
But then I saw that that movie was a series of contradictions that didn't make sense. How are you going to have Jay-Z on a track about revolution in a revolutionary movie when it's Jay-Z? Are you kidding me? Um, the Elvis movie. Bad. I think was very bad emotional marketing, but was definitely there for an award show kind of spectacleized grab with this James Baldwin biopic. I think especially now since Palestine and genocide increasingly is in the news, the fact that we are in an election year that we're debating about xenophobia in the U.S. as a country, or uh, we're in economic crisis. All of these are reasons to mine James Baldwin's legacy in a meaningful way because during his time he faced some of the same issues and he was critical about it in a way that I think people struggle to reach a more contemporary criticality about. And isn't that the point of revering, especially intellectuals? Like, I don't get why people want a more sanitized version of him, but I also think that people just want a more sanitized version of their own life in general. Like, if people aren't ready for revolutionary struggle or to engage with revolutionary thought, they're going to be angry when other people want to because they think it's a waste of time. And I don't think caring about history and culture is a waste of time. Um, and biopics are a central part of how we remember these figures, especially. It's like, we have to steal them back from Hollywood, I feel. The other thing that's really embarrassing about that Billy Porter interview, when, especially when he says, oh, I don't know about all that over there. Like, what do you call them then? Terrorists, blah, 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 blah. If you were in a conversation with James Baldwin, Billy Porter, he would fucking eat you up, spit you out, and it would be the end of your intellectual life. Like, I don't understand how you can try to represent someone and come nowhere near their sociopolitical analysis, especially if you're a gay black man. Like, I don't understand how you're not embarrassed. Like, people are going to look back at you and laugh. People are going to think this is ha-ha, he-he funny. And then you're going to get blacklisted. Or maybe not. Maybe this is what white people want. This interview in itself should be enough to get the production of this movie scrapped. We have some things to talk about. So it's been in the news lately that Billy Porter is in the works to make a biopic about the famed queer black writer James Baldwin. And if you are a follower of my YouTube channel or you've seen me on TikTok, you know that I'm a big fan of Baldwin. I've traveled to France numerous times. I did an artist residency in Saint Paul de Vence, France, where James Baldwin lived two years ago. And those vlogs are on my channel. I read Giovanni's Room every year. I love Baldwin. I read as much as I can about him. I've written a few different viral essays about him. I have been keen on talking about this. And I made a TikTok about a week ago that has gone viral and a few others have gone viral as well. Basically talking about what I'm going to talk about in this video. Billy Porter is a dangerous choice to co-write, co-produce, and lead act in a biopic about James Baldwin. And I want to explain exactly why because this is so important and it goes beyond clickbait or hot takes. For me, I take this seriously because I'm a black queer contemporary writer. I've traveled in Baldwin's footsteps. I've seen some of the pitfalls of some of his approaches to the way he looks at the world. I've experienced some of the weirdness of being black abroad and navigating politics and feeling a deep awareness of my mortality. And I'm also deeply invested in history to the point where I wrote about James Baldwin in my debut book, When They Tell You To Be Good, and I wrote about how he helped me find the courage to go to France in 2016, how I fell in love for the first time there, how I went to protests, how I started reading more of his work, and how his book, Giovanni's Room, gave me the courage to fall in love. And so when I rant about James Baldwin, it's literally not just to get views online, it's because I care about him as a figure, literally like... I don't know if you can see it, but up here in my writing room, I keep a photo of him. He's offered so much to so many people. For those that don't know, he was born in 1924 in New York City to a mother, his stepfather. James Baldwin had a complicated relationship with his father, his, his stepfather, who was a preacher. He was a child preacher himself for a number of years, and then he 
kind of found his way out of the church. Eventually, he moved to Greenwich Village and started writing articles and book reviews while working at various restaurants. And then eventually, at the age of 24, in 1948, he went to France for the first time, largely because of his impending sense of doom and mortality because of systemic racism in the U.S. He went on to write many acclaimed novels like Another Country, Giovanni's Room, The Fire Next Time, as he wrote Notes of a Native Son, He's written numerous collections of poetry, plays. He even wrote a screenplay based on the autobiography of Malcolm X. Last year, it was announced that Billy Porter was slated to co-produce, co-write, and lead act in a biopic about James Baldwin. And what I think is interesting about this announcement when I first read it is that the biopic is going to be largely based on David Lemming's biography about James Baldwin. David Lemming knew him for I think close to 25 years. The book has so much intimacy and warmth and clarity and I think it's because it's someone that knew Baldwin, stayed close to him in a lot of ways. In some ways, you could say that this on this gives you some hope. But then we have the travesty, which is Billy Porter's Guardian interview. A few weeks ago, Billy Porter did an interview with the journalist at The Guardian. Those friends people make $100 million a year. I'm getting six cent checks. It's not okay. Billy Porter on race, recognition, and the Middle East. And Billy Porter basically shows his ass as a queer capitalist who is sad about the writers and actor strike that recently happened. And so now he's doing a bald and a biopic for a cheap fucking cash grab and awards grab. And one of the first quotes in the interview in the third paragraph of this already. I have a few different James Baldwin book recommendations, but I'm going to give you the classics. If you're trying to dig into his fiction easily, the two books that a lot of people recommend and that I would also recommend is Giovanni's Room and Another Country. Both are really beautiful, lyrical, and they kind of represent James Baldwin's literary style of trying to navigate love, identity. Giovanni's Room is especially my favorite because it's so fixated on this question of what happens when we are unable to love other people and it's so good that i read it once a year if you're looking into his non i would recommend notes of a native son which has some of his most famous and well-known essays including a letter that james baldwin wrote to his nephew which is what Between the World and Me and Tana by ta Coates was modeled off of. Or if you want something a little more contemporary, The Devil Finds Work. That's another interesting one that's more contemporary and deals with a lot of his cultural perspectives on Black life and culture in the 60s, 70s, and 80s especially. And then I'm going to recommend like one or two films. If you want just like a broad overview of James Baldwin's life, I recommend the documentary Price of the Ticket. Um, which just takes you through his life, his travels abroad, his writings, why he was so well known to so many people. And then if you want something that's more of a deep cut, I would recommend the documentary Meeting the Man. is really cool because you can see James Baldwin pushing back against these European filmmakers that are trying to kind of ask him questions to push him into a corner. And because he's so good at debating, it doesn't work. And I think that documentary is on YouTube right now. This is a James Baldwin documentary about the writing project that almost broke him. Why? Let's find out. I come in two weeks. I can't. And I, you know, everybody works the way he can work. I must point out, though, too, that I've been working the last few years between assassination. That doesn't make it any easier either. I mean, they're killing my friends. As simple as that. Baldwin is already so skeptical of Hollywood. He already knew that Malcolm X was dead. He really loved Malcolm X fiercely and thought they had a lot of political allegiance in terms of like the rage that they brought to how they confronted liberals and neoliberals and how they didn't necessarily believe in nonviolent direct action. And so Baldwin took this script seriously, but throughout the process, um, Columbia Pictures wanted to change various aspects of it. They brought in a collaborator that would regularly take different scenes of Baldwin's script and rewrite it and kind of shift it into a different kind of cinematic language. And eventually, a few months into working on the script, it's April of 1968, and Baldwin is sitting by a poolside, literally doing an interview about the process of writing this screenplay, when he receives news that Martin Luther King has just been assassinated. This sends the nation and the world into a spiral. Um, James Baldwin has to go to Atlanta to attend the funeral. He's deeply traumatized. He wears a suit that only weeks before he had to get for an event that he had to do with Martin Luther King Jr. And... 
you can kind of see during this period of time, especially if you watch I Am Not Your Negro, that something is breaking in James Baldwin. And because the process of writing this script is so stressful and he kind of sees how Hollywood is trying to spin this more sanitized version of Malcolm X that doesn't talk about the Nation of Islam or Malcolm X's last trip to Mecca that really radicalized and shifted his perspective and made him even more committed to the process of liberation. Having to deal with all of these things, this death, this internal loss, this collective loss, it drove James Baldwin over the edge. Eventually, James Baldwin attempted to take his life and was taken to the hospital and eventually left Hollywood, abandoned this project with Columbia Pictures. He eventually went to Istanbul, and while he was there, he continued trying to write the script that would eventually become, what is the name of it? What's it called? One Day I Was Lost? Work with Columbia Records would eventually turn into Spike Lee's adaptation of this screenplay, which came out in 1992 with Denzel Washington as the lead role. And there are a lot of criticisms of that film, which I could talk about in other videos. But it's just researching all this stuff. It just makes me like, I love being a writer because you get to research and learn these things. And and history isn't just this one timeline story. It's layers and layers and layers. And I really want to encourage people to dig into the layers of history. And I mean, I just pray that these novel revisions can go well this month because I am so excited to research more about Baldwin this year and really dig into this collection of essays that I want to write on him. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching. At the end of Malcolm X's life, he was coming to terms with the fact that there needed to be a greater diversity of tactics beyond sort of black nationalism and sort of violent direct action tactics that he was advocating for. Malcolm X was assassinated and this led to efforts to have a screenplay made about him. James Baldwin had a great love for Malcolm X and in David Lemming's biography, it reads of their relationship. Because of his work on the film, Baldwin had by now closely identified with Malcolm and thought of him as a soulmate. As early as their meeting on the 1961 radio program with Eric Goldman, they had joined forces in a verbal attack on the conservative George Shiler of the Pittsburgh Courier, to whose middle-class Negro attitudes they had had similar reactions. Baldwin's mother and brother David, one had once worked at a party in New York with the Shuler's daughter, Philippa, had played piano. The Baldwin-Malcolm alliance that was forged in the early 60s was built on an understanding that they were clearly coming from the same place, a place from which King, a college-educated member of the Southern bourgeois, just as clearly like Schuler, did not come. Baldwin and Malcolm shared a temperament and an anger that was based in self-education and the deprivation of the Northern ghettos. Baldwin felt a lot of affinity towards Malcolm X. He wrote about how he had such a respect for him that that respect was indistinguishable from love. This August is James Baldwin's 100th birthday. Anniversaries are both a great opportunity for capitalists and the genuine supporters of a figure. What does it mean, a hundred years after Baldwin has been born, that a contemporary black actor like Billy Porter is supporting a Zionist state, is talking about capitalism and how it helps sell stories, and now he is trying to write a biopic about James Baldwin? And this is and this is what I mean in terms of like when people push back against me and they say like, why does it matter? Why does it matter? History matters. Art matters. After someone passes, what you do to honor them matters to them, I believe, on some level. If we believe in spirituality and ancestry and our connection to the past, now is a very fucking important time to memorialize James Baldwin in a way that would make him proud, that stands up to white supremacy, that speaks down to capitalism, that talks about our collective humanism and reaches back into history and understands it distinctly and radically so we can challenge the status quo of today. And this is why I'm so proud to be talking about him, to be learning about him, to be developing the collection of essays about him that I am, because I take history and these people seriously, because James Baldwin has offered me a lot, and I by no means believe he was perfect, and I by no means view him as a perfect human being. But I do think it is important to honor what people have done and to find the specifics of how they've helped you and helped other people and articulate those. Stay strong, y'all, because... Come his birthday, I do not want this biopic by Billy Porter to be happening.